Good evening to you. Welcome to the program. Joining me tonight, actor, writer and Camilla Roy and Torres Strait Islander woman, Nakia Louie. Also with us, Liberal Senator for New South Wales, Andrew Bragg. Joining us from Melbourne tonight, lawyer and community advocate, Niadol Nguyen. Writer, actor and Wangathi Yamaji man, Maine White. And shadow treasurer, Jim Chalmers. Remember, you can stream us on iView, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Quanda is the hashtag. Please do join the discussion. Now to our first question tonight. It's from Litona Dunge, sitting with her daughter, Cynthia, in our audience. The whole world has seen, has, has been outraged by the murder of George Floyd by police in Minneapolis. He was held down, on, down with a knee in his back, saying, I can't breathe, until he died. My son, David Jr., was killed in a very similar circumstances. David was a proud Dungati warrior who was killed in custody in Long, Long Bay Jail Hospital on the 29th of December 2015. David was 26 years old, just like George Floyd. David was pushed down into the ground by heavy officers. David cried out, I can't breathe many times in the space of, of his last nine minutes, despite over 430 Aboriginal deaths in custody since the Royal Commission. No police of prison officers has ever been held criminally liable. We know we have a long, long fight ahead to get justice. So I'm asking the panel Will you join us to demand charges are laid on the people responsible for my son's death? Main White. Arnie, I'm the same age as him. He could have been sitting here right now. Unfortunately, he's not. I was, on, I was at the process on the weekend. Um, since 2015, uh, in 2016, um, my nephew, uh, passed in Kalgoorlie. Uh, I know this experience all too well. I was arrested when I was 11 years old. I've been um, uh, searched for my pockets. Uh, this is a fight that I have to go on for the rest of my life. I'm an actor, but I'm a black man first. I'm an Indigenous man. I'm an Aboriginal man. Um, this is my life. I, I, I don't get to turn off. I don't get to switch off. I don't get to go home. I don't have that privilege. Um, I will be fighting until my last breath because racism isn't going to die. It's not going to leave. It's going to be here after I'm gone. Unless we do something about it. So I'll be fighting for the rest of my life. Lutona, Cynthia, can I just ask, you've talked about the similarity between the death of George Floyd and, and your son's death. When you heard that those were George Floyd's last words, how did you react? Well, the whole family was so devastated and tears just come all from our eyes. We we just couldn't believe that it's been a, a repeat. But in, in, over the overseas, it's happened with a black black man. And a, it's not good. And you've got black man here in Australia that's got killed the same way. So I, it's so devastating for two mothers. Nakia Louie, when you hear a cry for something simple like justice, I mean, do, do you feel anything is enough in terms of a response? OK, well, first of all, I just want to say thank you so much for being here. You were so brave. Um, I, you know, I grew up being scared from the police, you know, a similar way. I'm an Aboriginal woman and a Torres Strait Islander woman before I'm ever an actor or a writer. You know, I know what it's like to have your dad leave and not come back and you don't know what's happened, to live in fear. I'm lucky because I have fair skin privilege and really that's the difference sometimes between being alive and being dead and I want that to be very clear because we're not crying out for justice, Hamish. We're saying don't kill us. That's a really basic, simple request. Do not kill us. We don't need to be coming to the table with this. It just needs to change because it's been happening. The Royal Inquest into Deaths in Custody happened in 1991 that was the inquest. There were people being killed in custody before then. Aboriginal people have been fighting for our lives since 1788. Black Lives Matter in this country has been a movement since colonisation. So we're not asking for the world. We're asking 
to live. And to be honest with you, Andrew, yeah, we can say there's good police, there's bad police, but quite frankly, if people in positions of authority can't not kill a vulnerable, a vulnerable person who's locked up, then maybe we need to relook at these institutions because the thing is, is that we can change them. They're just that, they're just institutions. And if they are set up where you can't even trust that someone isn't going to be killed with a knee on their neck because they can't breathe, then that institution isn't working. So for me, I stand by you. I'll be there every step of the way. And I'm sorry that had to happen to your son. And um, I just, I, I still can't believe we're fighting for it for this day. I'm sorry. I, I, I thank you for being so brave. When Could you, I just, you, um... just, if you wouldn't mind, just waiting a moment, Niado, Nikira, I just want to understand though, when in the context of everything you've just said, when yeah. the Prime Minister responds to this moment and says there is no need to import things that happen in other countries, that that Australia is a wonderful country, how do you respond to that? Well, I think it's incredibly ignorant, and I think it's, uh, you know, I think it's purposely so. I think a lot of people would would argue it's a wonderful country. I'm sure the family of David Dungay would argue if it's a wonderful country. You know, police brutality is the very tip of the iceberg because we see it. The bottom of the iceberg is that there are massive inequalities with Aboriginal life since closing the gap. I mean, this is a broad spectrum thing. So when the Prime Minister says this is a wonderful country, he should really you know, it's tone deaf and it's disrespectful because Aboriginal people, all we want to do is, is, is have equality. All we want to have to do is an opportunity to reach for the stars and dream and we just don't want to... We don't want to be killed because we're black. And so I think it's, it's, it's incredibly tone deaf. And also, if he talks about importing issues from overseas, Black Lives Matter has been, as I said, it's been an issue here since colonisation. It's been an issue since the Frontier Wars, since 1938 when we had our first day of mourning when they were protesting not to take our children. That's Black Lives Matter. So this isn't imported. And also, if the Prime Minister wants to talk about uh, importing issues of the US presidency, well, the Coalition has had a long history of uh, going and banging the, the drum behind the US when it comes to other foreign political issues, Vietnam War or recently COVID-19 and... So I, I think, you know, it's, it's, it's been it's picking and choosing. It's a complete denial. That's mm. what it is, really. It's been continuous since uh, Captain Cook landed on the shores. It's, it's still happening. It's a denial of our existence. It's a uh, denial of uh, our existence this whole entire time because it hasn't been an issue that has ever been raised. It's, it's, it's still happening right now to this day. Last Friday, a brother boy died in Western Australia. This is, we're still talking about it now. It's a denial of what's happening right now. These institutions are killing us and, and it's just the continuation the whole time since 1770. It's the same thing. That's what it is. Just, and what, what are we going to do about it? We're not, we're not asking, we're demanding. We're demanding justice. And those, those protests in America, you, 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 they're not protests, they're demanding it. And this is what's happening. There are riots and people are talking about order. Who cares about order if there's no justice? We want justice. I'm sick of talking about being order. Because um, you know what? It doesn't work. Being peaceful, peaceful protests don't work. You, you, you're never satisfied. You're never happy for what we do. It, i got to sit here and i gotta, I got to be the nice guy. I don't want to be the nice guy no more. Because no one listens to you. No one listens to you. I'm sick of being this person, that, this animal. I don't want to be an animal no more. I just want to bring in Niado because I know you were trying to, to say something during yeah. that. I just wanted to say, I think um, what we're hearing here is the need just for acknowledgement that, um, that Indigenous people have suffered great, great, great injustice. Um, and the statement that this is not America is really a statement that shows either indifference or a unacceptable lack of awareness. Um, it's a statement that I think is used to defer away from talking about things that are wrong in this country. And it's used to defer these things in two ways. First, of course, obviously, is to say, don't bring whatever is happening in America here. And secondly, is to tell people that things are not as bad as America. But from the stories we've, he we've heard here today from Indigenous people, Things are as bad. Things have always been as bad. You know, we have Indigenous people that have lived on this land but have been dispossessed of their land. They've watched their culture destroyed. They've watched their children killed. They've seen over 400 people die in custody without no one being held accountable. And that, 
the way that Indigenous people have been treated is a clear statement that our institutions are not adequately addressing the serious issues that are here. So I think to tell a group of people who have been surviving since colonialism that things are not as bad is tremendously dismissive and erasive of the issues that are happening. And also, even if you look at other groups of people, and I admit and completely accept that our situation is not comparable to what Indigenous people are going through, but you can also see traces and complaints about racism, race profiling among African Australians and other people of, of, of uh, who are non-white. And these have been recorded, they've been litigated, um, and there are accusations that include even assault and abuse, allegedly, by police. Um, and so the idea that somehow uh, this is not happening in Australia is not true. Uh, it is happening. What I tend to find in this discussion, uh, unfortunately, and without wanting to point fingers, is that the people who tend to say these comments, the people who say things are not bad, you know, um, are not, do not look like the kind of people that would end up beneath the knee of a somebody having the life squeeze out of them. So perhaps to those people, you know, perhaps if we're really serious about moving forward collectively as a country, perhaps, perhaps sit down and actually listen to the pain that you're hearing here to truly take it in and to realize that sometimes we might live in the same country but experience completely different realities. Our next question tonight uh, is the mother for, of a young Indigenous teenager who was filmed being kicked and pinned to the ground by New South Wales police officer last week. Uh, what's your question for the, for the panel tonight? And I should just note for our audience, uh, we are not identifying you because uh, your son is not to be identified or named either. Mm -hmm. um, so I just wanted to ask, in these unprecedented times, since a video was released of my son being kicked to the ground by police, a lot of men from my community um, and other people that just approached me in the public have come to me to say this has happened to them as well. Um, there's been numerous recommendations still not addressed from the 1991 Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody and the 400 and plus further deaths since then. So why haven't adequate juvenile justice preventions and uh, interventions yet occurred so that police culture and attitudes um, changes towards our mob, especially our children? And, and further, should police or cops investigate their colleagues that are having a bad day or should their violence be assessed by an independent body? And before we go to the panel, can I ask you, the, the police commissioner in your state reflected on this incident and said that he thought the, the officer might have just been having a bad day. How, how did you receive that comment? I'm my son's mother and he's only a, a child. Um, this is a police officer that's meant to protect and serve and deal with crime. I don't believe he was doing anything criminal. Uh, he had every right to be where he was supposed to be. Um, the onus was on him to act professionally. Mm. The onus, onus was on him. <sighs> it's difficult because People can't check their own mindset, what they're doing. I believe not many, a, a lot of people in the back of their mind, they would think that um, they have the right to do with us what they want because of that disparity between, you know, the, the dignity or the humanness of us compared to other people. Um, so I don't, I don't think it's my, you know, it's not my responsibility. I'm advocating for my son. If it was done in another area, then that person would be charged with assault. So we want systemic change and we don't see that there's any, um, that, those kind of comments and what Prime Minister Morrison said shows any will for the dignity and our rights as Aboriginal people. Let me put that to you, Jim Chalmers. Well, first of all, to you, uh, Auntie, I can't imagine what it was like to see the, the footage 
uh, of, your, of your son and what happened to him and, and clearly as well, uh, the uh, injustice of the situation with, with David, with your son. Uh, and what it reminds us is that even for those of us who care very deeply, uh, not just about understanding uh, discrimination and injustice, uh, but people who genuinely want to eliminate it, you know, we can understand what this injustice looks like, but we can't understand what it feels like, right? As a 42-year-old white male in this society, uh, the reason we need to listen to what Maine said and Nakia said and your story and your story, Auntie, as well, uh, is because it's only the accumulation of all of these stories of injustice uh, or of discrimination uh, that we can build up the will to act as a, as a country. And when we were talking before about the Prime Minister and, and this wonderful country, we can be a wonderful country, but we won't be until we get this right, until we make things right. Uh, we won't have social and economic justice for all of us unless and until we have social and economic justice for the first of us. And that's how we need to approach it. And that has, um, you know, that means a lot of different things. Uh, clearly, it's been disappointing the progress that hasn't been made uh, since uh, the report into black deaths in custody, clearly. Uh, and clearly there's a role for doing better on uh, how we resource our Aboriginal legal services, uh, how we get the justice programs right, how we get the custody notification system right, all of those very specific things. But overarching that, I think, is something you know, bigger and, and more important, and it is partly about statement from the heart. Uh, but it's also about kind of recognising that until we get this right, we won't fulfil our potential as a country. You are still relatively early in your political career. You've heard tonight the examples of all the things that have been promised but never done. Can you honestly tell Australians watching tonight that you could actually solve these problems, that you could bring our nation together around the ideas that are needed to actually deliver on, on the very fine words that have been said time and time again for decades and actually deliver what Nakia has said. Just don't kill black people. Yeah, well, the responsibility is on all of us. You know, it's not something that one person can change. It's something that we have to change together. Uh, but there has to be the will. Uh, there has to be the commitment. Uh, we have to go beyond explaining or understanding or analysing discrimination. Um, we have to try and eliminate it. Uh, and, you know, there have been landmarks along this road. Um, Prime Minister Keating at Redfern around the corner, the Uluru Statement from the Heart, uh, the referendum. There have been all kinds of landmarks al along this road, but we're not where we need to be along it. Uh, and that will only change when... The kinds of stories that we're hearing tonight from the panel uh, and from um, the audience, you know, when that makes a sufficient difference to how we feel about our country, that we all want to do something about it, not just one person or one party or somebody, but all of us. Senator Bragg, the truth of it is that in Australia within the last couple of weeks, if you're a, if you're a, a black teenage boy and you swear at a cop, you can end up with your, your head being slammed into a pavement. If you're a white mining executive, you can press the button and mm. blow up 46,000 years of black heritage on this continent. Mm. I mean, and you can do that without any punishment. Does that seem fair? Well, Hamish, I'm not an Indigenous person, uh, but I've spent the year I've had in public office to try and listen as, 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 as well as I could um, in places like Kempsey in the Central Coast and in Redfern where there are large Indigenous communities. And the feedback I get consistently is we need more control locally to, con to control our affairs so that we can get the policies and the laws that we need um, to, uh, you know, that, that we desire. So that, that, that is, like, when I look at Uluru, I mean... But I, you, I'm I, sorry, but that was a question about fairness. Does that... Does that those two simple facts together, does that well, seem of, fair Of course it's not fair because, as I said, I mean, we have failed on Indigenous policy. Australia is a great country, but we have not delivered for Indigenous people. And that is why we need to accept the hand of friendship that I see Uluru as being, which with tangible proposals to improve 
the lives. I mean, th th this is what the, the leadership is. <coughs> I saw you nodding, though, all the way through what Maine and Nakia were saying. Did you agree that the Prime Minister was, was tone deaf in, in what he said? No, I, I think the Prime Minister is talking about <laughs> what is happening abroad. What I'm referring to tonight is a failure to make Australia a great country for Indigenous people. Oh, so does that mean no. reform or dismantling or throwing the systems in the it, bin? It or does it, what does it mean? Because like, I didn't hear an answer from either of you. Also, Andrew, you said this is a wonderful country. I want you to look these two families in the eye. Sorry to point at your aunties. Look them in the eye and tell them it's a wonderful country. I, I said that it was a great country, but it is not delivered for Indigenous people. And that's why we need to do so it's not much a be, work. It's not going to be a great country until we have equality for all people. Well, that is the it's point. It's a I'm... false sense of a great of greatness. It's a mythology you want to feed yourself so you can go, oh, well, everything's good, but these fellas, oh, well, just from to the side, it's their fault. And here's the thing. We're talking about all these landmark cases. We're talking about, oh, what are we going to do? How do we come to the table? We've told you what to do. A lot of the uh, recommendations from the original Royal uh, Inquest <coughs> Death, Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody, they weren't implemented. What you can do is you can listen to the families. They can tell you right now what they want. Listen to the families. The answer has been here all along. It's been a lack of political will. Mm. So I don't think it's fair to think that we have to say there's this long way to go and we need to figure out an answer. No, we need politicians to implement it. And you just haven't. And at the moment, what's happening is that when we have the young man, you know, getting face slammed in a park by police, that's what he's doing on camera. What is happening behind closed doors? And we know people are getting killed. So what we need to do is listen to the families and just not do it. And you all, you're now going, oh, well, well, we need to come to the table. We need to figure out a way. The way is there. Use your political will to change it. And the onus isn't always on us either. That, that's got to come from you. Yeah, what are we going to do? Not be about original? reconciliation. That's not the onus on us. That's the onus on you. That's the onus on your ancestors, not ours. You know what I mean? And, and, and see, there's, I don't see any change. I, I don't see anything that's put forward. Both things that came out of both of your mouths was hot and lovely fluff. That's what it was. So, I, I, like, can you give a real answer? I don't know. I haven't, seen, I haven't heard anything. And the issue is, Maine and I are actors and writers. We're up here today because, oh, well, I don't want to speak for you, Maine, but as an Aboriginal person, you know, first and foremost, I'm, I'm here because I feel that responsibility to my community. But there are peak bodies who have done tons of research into this. We have the Aboriginal Legal Service. We have Natsals. We have Nacho. We actually have... Aboriginal experts who have put plans forward on how to actually change things. So uh, you I should mean, be listening to them and yeah. not sitting here telling Australia, oh, we need a long way to go hand in hand. We've come to the table. Now, Kira, I agree with you. Uh, I actually said in my contribution before that what's lacking here is will and commitment. Well, both uh, I'm not pretending that we need to start from scratch here. I think that the in my, uh, you know, entire adult life, there's not been a more important statement than the statement from the heart. That is a roadmap. Uh, there has not been As an enough... Aboriginal person, I can tell you that that was a really great statement, but Aboriginal people have said lots of statements along the way. OK, well... We've I'm had just... many great leaders, so if that's the most important statement you've heard, you need to do some more Aboriginal history and talk sure. to more Aboriginal people. So this is from Barry Mullen in Goulburn, New South Wales. Barry served as a New South Wales police officer for 27 years. Our police are often called upon to deal with social issues that fall well outside the legal and criminal justice system. Discrimination, poverty, homelessness, mental illness, addiction and lack of social services are just a few. Are we asking too much of our police to deal with such a wide range of social problems while balancing their primary community policing roles? Niadol, I'm interested in your thoughts on this. You've worked with young people in Victoria but also police. Is this something that can be expected of police to, to solve? Well, I, I'm not sure. Um, I, and I don't think that's something that can be put back on the communities that are being policed or um, over-policed. I think that's something that rests um, predominantly with policy makers. Um, I, I do think that um, the relationship between police and certain communities is, is very problematic. And in Victoria, for example, during the Hale Michael case, it became quite clear, and, and I'm just focusing on the Hale Michael case and because it's, it, it involved African-Australian young people and because I'm, I, I try to be conscious not to speak um, on Indigenous issues since I'm, I'm, I'm not Indigenous. Um, 
you know, it, it really did, did show that there was some really serious problem. But what happened, though, was that Victoria Police did take some initiative um, and try to implement some policies to deal with some of the racist attitudes that um, resulted in the over-policing of African young men. So at that time, you know, due in the Flemington and Kensington areas, uh, young men, young black men were being stopped at least um, two and a half times more than the, the, the other groups, other young people of, of other ethnic background, even though they were committing, at the time, significantly less, less crime. So there was specific targeting of, of young people because there was a larger perception that they were committing more crimes, and though it did not bear out in the statistic eventually. But Victoria Police did try to implement some, some policies, but um, it didn't go far enough um, to, in, in terms of documenting their interactions with, um, with young people and ticketing young, those, those young people so that there is evidentiary basis to trace back if things go wrong. I think in this area of police reforms, there is a lot that can be done, um, um, including... Uh, in my view, at least, the independent investigation of, of, of misconduct, because police investigating police throw up some inherent um, conflict of interest. Mm -hmm. And in Victoria, for example, um, we sadly ended with a situation where the head of the, the, the professional conduct um, a team of the Victorian police, who was quit, who quit eventually, um, and who was kind of supervising this area, was actually making racist statements online. Um, and, and this was a person that was responsible um, for, for, for police um, um, professional uh, uh, standards. So you can see where this really throw up some, sure. some really big problems and, and kind of, I think, entrench a mistrust of, of police and, and uh, in, in those communities that feel they're targeted because they don't think that they're going to get any justice eventually when police are investigating other police. I, I just want to bring Maine in here to speak to that point uh, because it seems like trust is a, is a really core component of whatever the disintegration of the relationship has been in many circumstances. Can you just take us back to November 10 last year, uh, I think it was, you, you tweeted a day after... Uh, Northern Territory Police shot a 19-year-old man, uh, Kumanjai Walker. Can you share with us a, a sort of uh, a version of, of what you, you said that day? Um, well, I, I didn't say I had a, a lot of good things to say about them because I came from a place uh, from emotion. I was angry. Mm. Um, this was a, a child, you know what I mean? Um, and he was shot and, and killed. Um, it doesn't matter what the circumstances of what happened beforehand. This, is, this should never be. Uh, this should never be the outcome. And if, like we said about um, young fellow last week, auntie's son, if you're not equipped, what that question was before, if you're not equipped with the tools to to uh, to identify how to how to uh, contain any of these problems, then you shouldn't be a police officer. Or your training, you need to be you need to be better trained. Or you shouldn't be in in the force at all. Mm. And then at the same time, I, I, like, to be honest, I, I, I don't have a lot of um, uh, trust or for authority at all, really. And, and take us back to sort of your early that What I said about that, yeah. Well, well even beyond that, because I think 10 or 11 is the age at which you were first stopped mm -hmm. and searched. What does that do to your perception oh, of, I was terrified. of a police officer? I was terrified. So now that they, I beca it becomes fear, becomes anger. And then when I see, like, things around the world and when I see my brother boys in my own country, how do you think I'm going to feel? I'm, I'm going to be scared from the get-go. Like, it, 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 it just happens today. On the weekend, on Saturday, when I marched, I had my lawyer's name written in permanent marker on my arm. My brother boys had cameras on their shirts, just in case, because it wasn't legal at the, at the end of last week. And then we had the power of the people and those two lawyers that stuck up for us, those non-Indigenous brothers and sisters that helped us. Those people made it happen and we, happened, we made it happen because it was the power of the people. And it didn't happen until the day because there was too many people. That's what, and now people are getting scared and frightened because our non-Indigenous brothers are sticking up for us and are there with us. That's what that reaction was today. Who cares about the pandemic? The, the pandemic is Indigenous lives are dying. Black people are dying. And racism has been going on for millennia. It's been happening for thousands of years. That's, that's what racism, that's the pandemic. That's why people are marching. That is the reason. It's because it, 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 you can contract it from social distancing. That's why people are out there. That's why we're angry and that's why we we're sick of it. We're tired of it. I'm tired of it. I don't know how else to put it. What else do you want? It's been a big discussion tonight. Uh, we're going to leave you with something to reflect on. 
This is a monologue from Maine Wyatt's recent play about black identity and police brutality. This is Maine Wyatt, City of Gold. I'm always going to be a black friend, aren't I? That's all anybody ever sees. I'm never just an actor, I'm always an indigenous actor. Hey, I love rapping, but I don't hear old Joe Bloggs over here being called white Anglo-Saxon actor, blah de blah I'm always in the black show, the black play. I'm always the angry one, the tracker, the drinker, the thief. But sometimes I just want to be seen for my talent, not my skin colour, not my race. I hate being a token, a box to tick, part of some diversity angle. Oh, well, what are you whinging for? You're not a real one anyway. You're only part. Well, what part then? My foot? My arm? My leg? You're either black or you're not. You want to do a DNA test? Come suck my blood. How are we to move forward if we dwell on the past? That's your privilege. You get to ask that question. As we can dance and we're good at sport. You go to weddings, we go to funerals. No, 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 you're not your ancestors. It's not your fault you have white skin, but you do benefit from it. You can be okay. I have to be exceptional. I mess up, I'm done. There's no path back for me. There's no road to redemption. Being black and successful comes at a cost. You take a hit whether you like it or not because you want your blacks quiet and humble. You can't stand up, you have to sit down. Ask the brother boy Adam Goods. A kid says some racist shit, not ignorant, racist. Corner black fella and ape, come on man, we was flora and fauna before 1967. No, actually, we didn't even exist at all. But he got it, this was a kid. This was a learning moment, he taught that kid a lesson. But did they like that? A black man standing up for himself? Nah, they didn't like that. You shut up, boy. You stay in your lane. Anytime you touch a ball, we're gonna boo your ass. So he showed him a scary black, throwing imaginary spears and shit. And did they like that? Oh, no, no, no. They didn't like that. Every arena, every stadium, they booed him. It's because the way the flog plays football. Bullshit. No one booed him the way they booed him until he stood up and said something about race. The second he stood up, everybody came out of the woodworks to give him shit. And what, he's supposed to sit there and take it? Well, I'll tell you right now, Adam Goods has taken it. His whole life he's taken it. I've taken it. No matter what, no matter how big, how small, I'll get some racist shit on a weekly basis and I'll take it. You know, it used to be that in your face, your bong, your black dog coon kind of shit. Gonna chase it down the ditch with my baseball bat, skinhead shit, when I was 14 years old. But nah, we come forward, we progressive, we're gonna give you that small, subtle shit. The shit that's always been there, but it's not that obvious in your face shit. It's that, oh, no, we can't be seen to be racist kind of shit. Security guard, following me around the store, asking to search my bag. They're walking up to the counter first and being served second or third or last kind of shit. They're hailing down a cab and watching it slow down to look at my face and then drive off. More than once, more than twice, more than once, twice on any one occasion. Yeah, that shit I'll get weekly. Sometimes I'll get days in a row if I'm really lucky. And that's the kind of shit that I'm letting them think they're getting away with. Because to be honest, I can't be bothered. I can't be bothered teaching their ignorant asses on a daily basis. I don't have the energy or the enthusiasm. It's exhausting and I like living my life. But then on occasion, when you call me on a bad day where I don't feel like taking it, I'll give you that angry black you've been asking for and I'll tear you a new asshole. Not because of that one time, because of my whole life. At least Adam danced and they still pissed and moaned. But it's not about that one time, it's about all those times. And seeing us as animals and not as people, that shit needs to stop. Black deaths in custody, that shit needs to stop. I don't want to be what you want me to be. I want to be what I want to be. Never trade your authenticity for approval. Be crazy, take a risk, be different, offend your family, call them out. Silence is violence. Complacency is complicence. I don't want to be quiet. I don't want to be humble. I don't want to sit down.